welcome to the big meeting of the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers. I'm Ann Worsey, and I'm one of the organizers of the Free Thinkers. We're a nonprofit corporation devoted to maintaining separation between religion and government. You can find out more about the Free Thinkers by picking up one of the flyers available at the or on the web at arfreethinkers.org, or the most reliable way you can get to know some of the people involved with the free thinkers. Let me tell you a story. In 2005, a man named Robert Higgins from Greenbrier asked the Freedom from Religion Foundation to help him contact people in Arkansas who were committed to the separation of church and state. As it turned out, his neighbor, also from Greenbrier, a lady named Sybil Smith was ready and eager to help. They began meeting with some other like-minded people and the Central Arkansas Free Thinkers was born. Sybil Smith, his neighbor, attended these events and most importantly, she talked to people and let them know that they were not alone, even as non-believers in the Bible Belt. The Central Arkansas Free Thinkers had the initial idea for the solstice display that since 2009 has been displayed on the uh, grounds of the Arkansas State Capitol. They teamed up with the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers to accomplish it, and a year later, the two organizations merged. Over the years of her involvement with the secular community, Sybil kept scraps of paper and other items and tucked them safely away. She organized these mementos into a collection of scrapbooks that record 15 years of history of the Arkansas Free Thinkers and the birth of the organized secular movement here. Through run-ins with government offices that didn't want to play fair, kickball games where playing fair was a fabulously fun time, civil rights rallies, and three Reason in the Rock conferences, civil collected memorabilia, news articles, and everything else she could get her hands on. Those scrapbooks are displayed on the table by the door and I encourage everybody to look through them before they leave here today. This series of scrapbooks will be among the first items that the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers will deposit at the Center for Arkansas History and Culture, which is an archival project of the University of Arkansas housed at the Central Arkansas Library System's Bobby Roberts Library. We also call it the Butler Center, just sort of for those who know. Because of her efforts, future generations will be able to learn the history of the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers through photos and ephemera, and not just in the minutes and reports of corporate business. Sybil has also donated a library of over 500 books to the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers. We don't yet know what we're gonna do with all these books. We're a little overwhelmed, but we're delighted to have them. And we do know that we will somehow see them into the hands of people who want to read and appreciate them. In 2012, at the first Reason in the Rock conference, the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers initiated a special award for people who had made significant contributions to the secular movement in Arkansas. The award was named in honor of Randall Fleck, who is the subject of one of Sybil's scrapbooks over there. Uh, he was known to his friends as Doc, and Doc Fleck was absolutely committed to secularism. He not only addressed secularist matters behind the keyboard in his blog, which was called Common Sense Plus, and it's still viewable on Blogspot, even though Doc's been dead for 10 years. He practiced what he preached and he seated secular groups all over the state. Susan Huffington is a past president of the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers and a co-founder with Sybil of the Central Arkansas Free Thinkers. And she's a past recipient of the Common Sense Plus Award and has said that Sybil Smith is the mother of my move to secularism. That's pretty significant. Sybil's scrapbooks record the history of the organization and the secular movement. Her gift of books ensures influence for, for years to come. And today we are pleased to present Sybil with the Randall Doc Fleck Common Sense Plus Award. We regret that she is not here with us today to receive this award and uh, accepting it on her behalf is Todd Billings, who is the founder of the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers.
Yeah, I'm very, very glad we decided to give this to her because Sybil has done so much and I'm very pleased to make sure this gets to her. So yeah, thank you on her behalf. Very glad they will present our free thought of the day. The free thought of the day comes from an actor named Stephen Fry, who's an, also happens to be an, athe an atheist activist. And it is this, you are who you are when no one else is watching. Thank you. Thank you, Byrne. One of the key functions of the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers is to make friends and connections. So if you don't know the person next to you or behind you or in front of you, please take a moment and say hello and shake their hand and introduce yourself. <laughs> the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers is a diverse organization with members who, present, who, who represent a wide range of opinions. We invite speakers who we think will be interesting and who will make us think. Today, we're pleased to have Nicole Stewart with us to tell us about street art. And we have an introductory video. People have been saying it for years. Nothing else, nothing new I want to say. All I'm doing is relaying the, the message. But man, it's enough is enough, man. The system's got to stop. And uh, we want to talk about humanity. I mean, you got to put people, yourself in other people's position, in other people's shoes. Uh, we always start to see one side of the, of, of the story. But, you know, somebody in power, you got to put yourself in both sides so you can lead that way by example with conviction. This used to be a travel a lot. I mean, a whole lot. I'm 58. And it has never been anything of quality here until now, never. I don't know it, why nobody thought to put something like this up here before now, and I hate this situation had to be the, right, right. Be, be the muse for it, but I couldn't, I can't think of anything better should be here than this right here. We were paying that besides since 2016. So we didn't, you know, we put the Central, Martin Luther King, Daisy Bates up there. So we, we've been down here doing our thing. Let me ask you a question. Is, and I know nothing guaranteed that nobody can police this 24 hours, cause, but is it, is it, I'm guessing there's no insurance that somebody won't come and vandalize it. And I no, don't want to speak something no, like that into No, they have before on their crowd. They, they, that's what I thought. Um, and it's happened, it's happened three times. Really? No, it, was, we, it was bad. We always fix it. Yeah, they put swastikas and stuff really? like that. Yeah, Martin Luther King, they did it like three different times. We always come back and fix it. And then when we come back and fix it, we add more artwork to the wall. We got more paper. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Each one 
five days of the year we want to represent a life that was taken from us too soon as a result of police brutality or racism or social injustice, okay? So I went out there Monday evening and I stood in front of that bureau. And I started to cry. And I started to cry because when I saw that you and I saw those names up there, I couldn't help to see the face of one of my students. I couldn't help to see and read the names of possible students that have been in my class before. Knowing that that could be them, that mural could be of one of our students here. Those names could be the names of some of our students from here in Little Rock. Here in North Little Rock, Pulaski County. We got people that came from Northwest Arkansas. Those could be your students. And as I sat there, I started to realize that what people mean when they say no justice, no peace. And I don't mean what y'all seen on TV. Not the no peace that y'all seen on TV because I do want to emphasize this is a peaceful protest. But I mean, the lack of peace in my life, the lack of peace in my life, the lack of peace in my life, knowing that our students, our black and brown students' lives could be at stake, that our black and brown teachers and educators could be at stake, that our black and brown parents could be at stake. And so proud of you cats, dude. It's so badass. So good to see you. So we're about to walk from the Capitol to your mural. How you feeling about that? Man, I don't know. It's just crazy, dude. Stewart is a local multimedia artist 
who is currently completing her bachelor's degree in studio arts with a minor in applied design at the Wingate Center of Art and Design at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. She works in a wide range of media as a painter and a sculptor and an oddities creator, a visual storyteller, a muralist, and as an added bonus has 20 plus years in the private event industry. In 2017 and 2018, she created an organized creative connection, which hosted monthly pop-up art events for the 7th Street Mural Project. She's donated her art and her time as a live artist for local fundraiser events, such as ALS, Arkansas Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, Youth Home, the Ar American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the Miracle League, Hope Rises Wellness and Recovery House, and this just is to name a few. She even teaches painting classes for the residents at Woodland Heights Senior Living Facility. And she's here to talk to us today about Little Rock Street Art. Please welcome Nicole Stewart. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank Anne and the Arkansas Society for Free Thinkers for inviting me here to speak today with all of you and to share with you the story of 7th Street Mural Project and my experience being involved with it. Uh, the short documentary that we watched was one of many underground creative projects created by local filmmakers Craig Wynn and Mike Poe, who were inspired by the artistic grassroots movement that took place during the summer of 2020, the 7th Street Mural Project. The murals are part of an art corridor that covers the walls on both sides of 7th Street, just below the Whitewater Tavern parking lot. The murals run underneath two Union Pacific Railroad train bridges. One uh, is non-functioning and the other still actively is in use and are only a short distance west of the state capitol. When you visit 7th Street, you will find yourself immersed in a vibrant world surrounded by a kaleidoscope of art filled with messages of peace and justice, memorials to the voices of the unheard, and also educational and historical documentation of the people and places that play an important role in the black and minority communities in the city of Little Rock. But how did all of this begin? Who planted the seeds for these incredibly inspiring and powerful pieces of art to emerge and grow? In 2015, Derek Brooks, who is part of the Arkansas Coalition of Peace and Justice, along with the help of poet and art educator, Laron McAdoo, came up with a plan to begin painting a mural with the help of local artists, students, and volunteers in the empty and forgotten space under the train bridges of 7th Street. The art event was in recognition of Arkansas Peace Week, which falls on the third week of September each year in coordination with the United Nations International Day of Peace. Arkansas Peace Week includes numerous events hosted by dozens of organizations throughout the state. These events feature education, service, dialogue, and outreach activities promoting the mission of Arkansas Coalition of Peace and Justice. There was such a loving response from the community over the beautification of such a neglected and desolate space that the work on these walls would immediately continue the following year. I remember overhearing locals that live nearby and artists enthusiastically talking about the new mural work. And at this time, there were very few murals in the city and this was the beginning of something new and exciting for activists and the art community. It wasn't long before many talented local artists were pulled on board to continue expanding the messages of peace and justice. The following year, in 2016, graffiti artist Jermaine Gibson and Jose Hernandez, as well as activist artists Tanya Hollingfield and Hamid Ebrahimifar, joined the Growing Mural Project for Arkansas Peace Week. With the addition of these talented local artists, the mural that started as a few small works under one bridge had begun to expand to both sides of the street and reach incredible new heights. With the addition of historical giants, such as Martin Luther King Jr., Daisy Bates, as well as representations of Central High School, the mural began to greatly amplify the message of Peace Week. The success of these murals came at a cost when the reality of our broken society reared its ugly head. 
After only one month of Martin Luther King's portrait up on the wall, it was vandalized with images of hate. Swastikas were spray painted over the words, make art, not war. Faces were whited out. Jose and Jermaine would quickly come to repair and repaint the art. But over time, this became an endless fight that was representative of the exact thing still going on every day in our society to minorities all across our country. But the vandalization worked against those creating it, and it only fueled the fire within the artists that were painting the murals. In counter protest, each time a mural was defaced, they would not only clean it up, but also expand the images to even larger and bolder works. Soon the efforts of the artists did not go unnoticed, and because of the battle between peace and those trying to destroy it, reached the press very quickly. They got involved and the exact messages that the murals were intended to speak about began to reach an even larger audience. Each year until 2019, the murals grew, the vandalism continued, but the artists always came back to fix it. However, the next year, everything would change dramatically. In 2020, the pandemic raged across the world, shutting down entire cities. People were getting sick and dying every day from COVID with what seemed like no end in sight. Quarantine had us all locked away from each other in fear. Everyone was at risk and the virus showed no discrimination. But another tragedy would be the direct result of discrimination and it would set off a series of events that had been coming to a tipping point in our country and the long existing racism and oppression of minorities was no longer going to be silenced. During the height of the pandemic on May 25th, 2020, George Floyd was murdered during a violent arrest by the local Minneapolis police. Communities all over the world exploded in protest and Little Rock was one of many cities to react. People took to the Capitol and to the streets, even blocking off Interstate 630 in protest of what the road represents, once part of a city plan to segregate its citizens and destroy black communities. Each night, the protests at the Capitol continued and many people were arrested, tear gassed, and hit with rubber bullets. The escalation of riot police and angry citizens caused destruction of some of the buildings nearby. Jermaine and Jose were asked to paint art on the boarded up windows of one of the buildings near the Capitol. And they decided to write the names of black and minority citizens from our community and others who were victims of police brutality. Five days after George Floyd's murder and in an effort to express their continued support for the community, work through their grief and somehow find a way to process their emotions about this event, Jermaine and Jose began to paint a portrait of George Floyd on the 7th Street walls. They had no idea how impactful this portrait would be or how much it would inspire people of Little Rock. On June 5th, Two local Black educators, Johnny Lane and Wendell Scales Jr., would organize a peaceful protest at the state capitol. The response to Injustice Education March encouraged teachers, parents, and students to speak out against police brutality. The crowd gathered at the state capitol, and as speakers stepped up to tell stories and recite po poetry, the entire gathering of people proceeded to then march down 7th Street from the Capitol to the George Floyd mural to place flowers and candles in front of the portrait. They chanted, they spoke, and observed a moment of silence dedicated to George Floyd and all the lives of those who were victims of police brutality. Jermaine and Jose attended the march and right in that moment, as they were surrounded by their peers and their community in front of that wall, they made a promise, a promise to continue to paint all the walls from top to bottom, until the messages of peace, justice, and equality would be heard. And this was the moment that was the birth of the 7th Street Mural Project. Following the educators' march, the call to artists began. Word was spreading about the murals and Jose and Jermaine began to reach out to their friends and local artists to come be a part of the movement. This is also the time when I received a call from Jermaine, who was a good friend of mine, 20 years. He wanted me to participate in the project. Coming to the wall was like an escape from the harsh reality of the pandemic and being quarantined to our homes. But we were also overwhelmed with another harsh reality, a reality that I, as a privileged white woman, did not have the burden to bear. 
the gravity of the community's reaction to social injustice that was no longer being silenced was so incredibly intense and emotionally charged. However, we were all thankful to be part of something so important outdoors in a safe space where we could interact with other artists and contribute to the message of the wall while advocating for our friends and neighbors. More than 20 artists have painted on the walls along with children and members of the community. There are too many to even list. But once we started, there seemed to be no stopping us. We were much like the freight trains that barreled overhead the bridge above us. Art went up faster than the media could keep up with. People in the community came every day to bring us food, water, paint supplies, or just to donate money to help us buy more paint and more supplies. People were showing up with garden tools and weed eaters to help clear the brush and vines from the walls so that we could paint bigger and higher. They wanted us to keep going and continue speaking out with our art, using it as a vehicle to inspire change and raise awareness. However, not everyone supported us or what we were doing, and they made that very clear. Cars would race down the street, revving their engines and threatening our safety as we painted or were unloading our supplies from our cars, sometimes even yelling profanities out of their windows while we worked. I often thought to myself that while we were only being yelled at for painting that day, the people that we were painting for would be treated this way any day of the week just for existing. The vandalism continued as the murals grew, but we always came back with more paint and more support. Several of our murals were defaced and it was and still is to this day a never ending battle to maintain the integrity of the art. Adeja Cooper, a young and upcoming art artist still in high school painted a mural that recognized black women who were killed due to social injustice. And it was vandalized not once, but twice. Her mural was completely blacked out and painted over both times. But every time a mural would be destroyed, we would band together, clean it up, and repaint. We always had more passion, more drive, and more paint than any hateful person could compete with us. After each defacement, journalists showed up, and every time the news told our story, the message we were painting on the walls was we trained further and further into the community. People came from everywhere to see the art. They would cry. They would tell stories. They would take pictures for prom and graduations. Fathers and mothers would bring their children and using the murals as educational tools to teach their children about history and to help explain to them what was going on in the world. Local musicians and rappers were filming music videos on 7th Street and writing songs about the events taking place around them. Filmmakers were documenting the progress and news crews and journalists were interviewing artists. Trains covered in graffiti, crossed the bridge like a roaring street gallery of art just above our heads, and sometimes even blowing the horn in recognition of our presence below them. There was a magical energy in the air that we were creating just by being there every day, painting, working, communicating, and inspiring each other. Each week, we became more organized. A core group of us began to meet outside of the mural wall to talk about blocking off the street, we had big ideas and we were fueled with inspiration. We wanted to give the community more and support local artists too. After many meetings, we began to organize several art markets hosted by the 7th Street Mural Project. We worked with the city to get permits to block off the street for free community art events where all were welcome. The goal was to give the public better and safer access to see the murals and meet the artists in person but we also wanted to create a safe space where local artists could feel free to express their creativity while sharing it with the community and spreading the message of peace and justice. After the street was blocked off, we featured local art vendors with handmade wares, crafts, and art. We created family and children's activities to encourage visitors to participate in art making. Muralists painted live, adding finishing touches to their murals they had been working on. Artists and Musicians were setting up to play songs. There were interpretive dancers filling the street. People sang. There were even cultural performers such as Mexican marachin dancers. We even viewed short films by local filmmakers and had a Day of the Dead themed celebration with traditional memorial altar. The events were a great success and the public really, really enjoyed it. The impact that 7th Street had 
on me as unforgettable. My eyes were open to so many things that I didn't either understand or that I was blind to because of my privilege. I gained so many friends in the art community and in the city. I developed a better and more clear perspective and understanding about what black and minority citizens go through on a daily basis. I learned how to be a better supporter and an advocate for those who don't have a voice and for those whose voices are never heard. I learned about the rich history and culture of the Ninth Street Business District. I learned how to shut up and listen to what people were telling me and pay attention to what was happening. I learned what minorities have experienced and how they feel is incredibly valid and we should respect and listen to them. I learned that together with love, people can do amazing things for each other. But most importantly, I learned that although I may not be responsible for racism or the atrocities of the past, I have the ability to use my privilege to help reverse those wrongs by speaking out against hate and discrimination and standing up for those that continue to be treated unequally. Over the past two years, the activity on 7th Street has slowed down as we have all tried to return to a normal life moving past the pandemic. We now remain keepers of the wall. We are still coming to fix the vandalism from time to time and touch up previous work. There are still spaces to be filled for other artists and also spaces reserved for upcoming events for the community. The activity on 7th Street is not completely come to a halt. The Arkansas Coalition for Peace and Justice continues to sponsor annual Arkansas Peace Week event, but now with the addition of the 7th Street Mural Project artist by their side. As a team, we plan to continue the art market events and this September on the 25th, we will be once again blocking off the street for the next Peace Week. Uh, there will be local vendors returning from past events selling art, more mural work being completed, more opportunity for local artists and the community to come together and spread the message of peace, justice, and equality. Information on this event will be available on Facebook and we will encourage everyone to please come and see the murals for yourself and meet the artists that are there. In conclusion, I would like to share a quote by a Canadian playwright, Lister Sinclair. And he once said, art pulls the community together. Art makes you feel differently. That's what artists are doing all the time shifting and changing the way you see life. Thank you. Um, did, uh, did one of the organizations you mentioned uh, have to get permission uh, to uh, paint on the uh, on the uh, walls? So the wall is kind of like in this odd space because it technically belongs to the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, I believe when they first went to find out about painting on the space, um, they went to the city at first and the city was like, you know, it's not our problem. You gotta go talk to the railroad. And so from there they talked to the railroad and the railroad's answer was basically as long as it doesn't, you know, impede with the trains or anything that it was completely fine. So it kind of just became this free space to the community where we could do wherever we wanted to it. I have another question. Um, did, you, did you, you have to put down the sealer first before you start painting on it? We don't do sealers. We typically just put down like a base paint, like a flat white or um, uh, a light color. Like sometimes even just wall paints uh, work just fine as a base. And then the paint is usually applied on top of that. We do also um, use a mural shield protectant. Um, some of it has been donated to us by the downtown partnership. They had some leftover from some murals that we use. And then we've also been using donations to buy more because the space is incredibly large. Um, we have sealed most of the murals that are completed, but still some are in the works. And once those get finished, we'll come back and seal those. You have to use a sprayer. It's it's quite a bit of effort, um, equipment and, and time and money that it takes to do it, but well worth it because if it does get vandals, vandalized, what we can do is come back and just uh, pressure wash off the vandalization and it won't remove the art. I see. Yeah. And what was the commonly used paint? Was it like an exterior or latex paint or? The paints that we were using? Yeah. Um, well, um, 
so the graffiti artists, they, there is actually graffiti spray paint that is specifically made for outdoor art. It won't fade in the sunlight. It's, it's a little bit more expensive. Um, you can find it in some stores, but most of the time it's something that we have to order like through the companies directly. Um, but then sometimes like, you know, when we first started, we didn't have a lot of money. Everybody wasn't working. It was pandemic. We were just getting whatever we had at the house. Um, even like, uh, rust-oleum paint and things like that um, you can use, but they do have a tendency to fade in the sun because they're not they're not specially formulated for those outdoor murals. So, so all the in all the pictures we saw were those was it all done with spray paint, not roller or brush? Uh, mostly um, uh, on some of the ones that are taller in the large spaces, we would roller on to like block out large parts of color. So we would use bucket paint for certain areas. Um, but um, yeah, most most of it, all the line work, the detailing and everything is is all mostly primor primarily spray, spray paint. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, are the, is the artwork done freehand or do you use like projections or a grid to get the image onto a larger space? It's a variety, it depends on the artist. Um, I work entirely free-handedly, so it's a lot of uh, getting up, getting down, getting up, getting down, you know, backing away to see, but uh, projecting is something you have to do at night, and a lot of the artists also would do that. Um, they might work out a design ahead of time and bring the projector, and, and so we would always try to um, be there in numbers, never alone, um, any time that an artist was down there in the evening to make sure they were safe, also to make sure a car wouldn't come through when you're trying to to project an image on the wall. And when they do that, they usually just kind of do a rough outline of, of the image to get the proportions right with the projection, but then they come back during the day and start filling it in, you know, kind of like you would a coloring book. Did you personally do the backsplash for the one? Yes. And I did. was that based on a photograph or was that the reports that you had for the street there based on it? So, um, a couple of years before um, we started painting on the wall, I saw a documentary at UALR about uh, the Dreamland, Dreamland Ballroom and the Ninth Street uh, Business District. And I was really moved um, about the story of that neighborhood, which um, Ninth Street, the area of the community spans from where the Mosaic Templars uh, building is, past the Dreamland Ballroom. And then from there, it's cut off by Interstate 630. Um, but it crosses diagonally um, to the other side of 630. And a um, long time ago, it was a black business district that was um, completely supported by black business owners and communities and houses that all were in that area. It was very thriving. It was very culturally rich with music. And um, as time went on and the city started to grow, um, they were trying to push people out of the area because when they put 630 in, they needed all of that to be gone. And they basically just destroyed the whole community when they put in the interstate. And um, a lot of people lost their businesses and it just destroyed their, their whole community. And um, there's not very much left of Ninth Street today. The Dreamland Ballroom and the Mosaic Templars, I believe <clears throat> the only two main buildings that still stand. Um, but if you look online, there's a lot of black and white photographs that you can see of the area from its heyday, which, I mean, it existed basically from emancipation when like freed slaves settled there. And then it just became a, a community that just grew over time. And in the thirties, forties, fifties, excuse me, it um, became a cultural epicenter. <clears throat> For music <clears throat> and art, excuse me. <clears throat> but I used um, pictures from uh, the internet to make the um, drawings off of. It was very difficult. <laughs> Much like it is to talk in front of people. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so I just used pictures that I found online. And uh, that's, that's what I based my, my drawing on. And the really interesting thing was <clears throat> that uh, while I was painting the Night Street painting, um, people from the community were stopping by that lived there and grew up there at that time. And they were telling me stories and 
they were giving me information of other businesses to put up there. And so I use their stories as a, um, you know, another form of information to create that mural and tell the story of that neighborhood and just kind of represent the people and places and the businesses that existed there before it was essentially just wiped away. Where about the Ninth Street is it? Where's Ninth Street? No, where's your mural? Um, it's, it's on Seventh Street. Um, yes, so it's the Ninth Street mural on Seventh. It's kind of confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so all the murals are on 7th Street and they're on both sides of the road. They run underneath the train bridge. So if you actually park at the Whitewater Tavern, there's a set of stairs that you can walk down and you can like see all of the murals from there. Yeah, I mean, the mural you did is on 7th Street. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that the one with the businesses? Yes. Oh. The 9th Street mural is the one that says, it's called The Line. And um, that's what the community called it. They called it the line because it was like a drag of businesses and bars. Yes, it has like musical instruments and yes, so that's it. It's very large. <laughs> it took a long time. Yeah, I, knew, I know where 9th Street and 7th Street are, but I've never had a 9th Street. I've never seen it. Where is the one? Yes. Yes, if you go, um, from the Whitewater parking lot, when you get to that staircase, if you look straight across 7th Street, the, the 9th Street mural is directly across. Mm -hmm. It's really informative. Thank you, Nicole. Next month's speaker is going to be Kwame Abdul Bay. He is uh, the activism coordinator for the NAACP in Jacksonville. Well, they're headquartered in Jacksonville. Uh, and he's going to be talking about modern effects of slavery on Black families. I think that will be really uh, an important and timely talk topic because it's going to take place on June 19th. So um, we hope that you will return for that presentation. Now, back to the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers. If you're glad that people in central Arkansas are organizing a secular community, please consider joining the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers. You can join here in this room. Uh, there are gonna be forms at the back table, uh, or you can make a donation. Those of you who are watching online can go to arfreethinkers.org. And there is a link there for you to sign up, donate, join, whatever you'd like to do. Um, we want to create a community of like-minded people. And we have a whole calendar of events. Most of them are on meetup.com. Uh, and you can find us there. We have a hiking group that is going to be meeting Monday, this kind of tomorrow. Uh, but it meets Mondays and Wednesdays. We... Uh, have a pint night every Monday night that meets at Charlie's Good Time Drinkery uh, at 6.30 p.m. We have Zoom meetings that happen on Monday nights for those who are still not comfortable getting out and about during the pandemic. Um, for those who have uh, substance abuse issues, we do have a secular substance abuse recovery program. And you can look on Meetup to find out more information about that. We have disc golf. Seems like we always have disc golf on Sunday mornings. Uh, so that, it, well, actually it's, it's on Saturday, May 21st, next week's next week. I thought it was gonna be on Sunday. It's usually on Sunday. Um, on, also on June 19th, we are gonna be uh, doing a community service project. Um, we will be cleaning up the Fraternal Cemetery, which is connected to Oakland Cemetery on the east side of Little Rock. Um, this is the historically black cemetery. If we've got time and it's not too hot, we may go, go clean up the white folks too. But um, we, we want to focus on uh, Fraternal Cemetery to show our respect for the people who are buried there. We also support outside events that we think will appeal to our members, and that includes Socrates Cafe, 
which we hope will be meeting. Uh, right now, the libraries are being used as voting stations, which is better than having churches used as voting stations. So, uh, but you can check our calendar for when Socrates Cafe meets, and there's one scheduled for May 25th, which I believe is the day after the primary. We hope they'll have the machines out in time for, for Socrates Cafe to meet there. That's a discussion group. I love Socrates Cafe personally and go whenever I can because it's the one time that I get to go pontificate about stuff I know absolutely nothing about. Nobody criticizes me for it. So, um, if you would like to uh, host an event for the free thinkers, let us know. We'll be glad to put you on the calendar. Becoming a secular organizer is just that easy. And you can also participate in more of our meetings as time goes by in one of the roles that, that we have for member moment or misinformation moment or free thought of the day or even speaking if you have something important that you'd like to talk about. Thank you for coming and we hope to see you here next month, if not at one of our other meetings.